Om Magyana Timurandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksuran Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Namah Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pastaya Bhutale Shri Mati Bhaktivedanta Swami Niti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Pacharine Nervisesha Sunyavadi Paschacha Desha Tarine Vancha Kaupata Rukjasya Kripa Sindhu Bhaivacha Patitanam Pavane Bio Vaishnavi Bio Namo Nama Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasati Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So welcome everyone to our ongoing study of Bhagavad Gita at the level of Bhakti Shastri. Are you able to see the screen okay? Maharaj. Yeah? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Okay, good. Okay, review of lesson eight. Practice of Krishna consciousness transcendental to Varnasram Dharma. Why Krishna follows Varnasram Dharma? Krishna's response to Arjuna's fourth reason for not fighting and Krishna's analysis of lust. Okay, Krishna consciousness is transcendental to Varnashram Dharma. Meaning, people in any position in Varnashram Dharma can practice Krishna consciousness. It doesn't depend on their situation. Anyone, whether they practice Varnashram Dharma or not, they can practice Krishna consciousness. So Krishna consciousness has nothing to do with Varnashram Dharma. Why did Krishna follow Varnashram Dharma? To show an example. Krishna's response to Arjuna's fourth reason for not fighting. The fourth reason for not fighting creates unwanted progeny. So Krishna said if he, did, if he did, didn't fight, it would be the cause of creating unwanted progeny. So Krishna defeated Arjuna's argument and then Krishna's analysis of lust. I did want to show you something on that analysis of lust. Before we go into the fourth chapter, just let me show you. Here. Krishna's strategy, oh, oh, point, some points about the strategy to conquer lust, because it's one of your essay topics, so I want to cover it fully with you. And so here are some points which you might like to include. So one thing is, it's easier to control the senses than the mind and intelligence. Therefore we said in the beginning we should regulate the senses. That's the easiest thing to do. As a first step, one should regulate the senses by suitable engagement in Krishna consciousness. Suitable engagement in Krishna consciousness means chanting, taking part in kirtan, 
offering RT, some kind of regulation like that, or s s studying scriptures regulated. Gradually, one should similarly engage the mind and intelligence in the activities of devotional service until one finally develops a higher taste. We have to understand, it will take some time, it will take some practice to develop the higher taste. So gradually we get the mind and the intelligence involved. Gradually the mind and intelligence starts to take an interest in the scriptures. And studying the scriptures, maybe it's uh, re reciting slokas, maybe it's uh, different arguments against atheistic philosophies. And here's a quote from uh, Surrender Unto Me. I'll just read it to you. Beware of the polluted intelligence. We said lust could be seated in the mind, in the senses, in the mind, and in the intelligence. So if the intelligence becomes polluted, it's a problem here. The intelligence, like a guard, is the next door neighbor of the soul. And its business is to protect us from maya. If the guard has been corrupted by lust, however, the situation is as dangerous as when a bodyguard is bribed by the enemy. Thus, the materially contaminated intelligence which works in the service of our enemy should be neglected. We should instead accept the intelligence of Guru, Sadhu and Shastra. So I discussed this a little yesterday with you and you, you also answered like that, that in the absence of, if we do have contaminated intelligence, which we, we probably do, if we have some lust, it's probably reached our intelligence also. And the way to overcome it is to accept the guidance of Sadhu, Shastra and Guru. Alright, so that was just one point I wanted to bring to your attention. Let's go ahead. Mm. Okay, review of lesson eight, we had that. Overview of chapter four. Oh, Krishna. Here we go. All right. So five sections. First of all, transcendental knowledge about Krishna, and then Krishna as the goal of all paths and the creator of Varnashram. So we will cover these first two sections today. Then it goes on to karma yoga for the jnani. Jnanis can also do karma yoga. And then we hear about sacrifices resulting in knowledge. And the final section is the summary of transcendental knowledge. So that's the main points of the fourth chapter. Connection with chapter 3. Chapter 2, a lot of stress was given on transcendental knowledge and the sense of detachment that is meant to arise from it. In chapter 3, Krishna explains how lust covers knowledge. He also recommended yajna and karma yoga for spiritual elevation. Right? We heard about yajna and karma yoga. Krishna rec recommended that. We talked about lust covering knowledge. So now in the fourth chapter, Krishna explains jnana yoga is higher because both yajna and karma yoga culminate in such transcendental knowledge. So this is the fourth, the, the connection with the fourth, the third chapter to the fourth chapter. Krishna had been speaking about how knowledge becomes polluted and covered but at, at the same time, it can elevate one. So Krishna is going to explain Jnana Yoga.
and how it's, it's higher. Because both yajna and karma yoga, they, they, they end in transcendental knowledge. The purpose of yajna and karma yoga, that they become successful when we get transcendental knowledge. So jnana yoga is the, the stage above these things. Karma yogi, karma yogi doesn't know very much. He may be detached, but he doesn't have much knowledge. So gradually, it goes on, gradually he may get knowledge. Some realization may awaken, some devotee may give mercy to him because they see this person is very detached, he's very pious. So they, a devotee may give mercy to him in the form of transcendental knowledge. So in this way he gets transcendental knowledge. Thus, after urging Arjuna to be transcendental with the help of knowledge, Krishna now explains what that knowledge is and how it is received. Krishna begins the chapter speaking about the reasons and the eternal nature of his appearance and activities. So the first section of the fourth chapter is like that quite well known, the famous, quite a few famous verses there. So the chapter begins with the history of the Bhagavad Gita. Someone would like to read for us? Yes? Maharaj Let's have a Maharaj read. Okay, go ahead, Prabhu. Evam vivas tuate yogam proctavana amogjayam vivas van manve praha manu rikshva kavi apravit. The personality of Godhead, Lord Sri Krishna said, I instructed this imperishable science of yoga. To the sun god Vivaswan and Vivaswan instructed it to the Manu, to Manu, the father of mankind, and Manu in turn instructed it to Ikshvaku. Thank you. Okay, so Krishna is saying, long ago, the same knowledge was given to the sun god Vivishwan. Krishna gave it to Vivishwan. So this, the Bhagavad Gita is not just restricted to this planet. Oh, wait, what happened? Here we see history of the Gita. Krishna to Viviswan, 120 million years ago. And then Viviswan to Manu, 2 million years ago. Krishna gave to Arjuna 5,000 years ago. And Manu instructed Ikshvaku. And Ikshvaku gave it to the Rajashis, the saintly kings, right? So this knowledge, Bhagavad Gita, is meant for the saintly kings, the rulers of the society. They're meant to get this knowledge and they're meant to distribute it to the people, to the ordinary people under their care. The Rajashis are supposed to give protection and they will give protection by giving this knowledge awakening people to self-realization. Yes? Swata pramana veda satya yekaya lakshana karile swata pramanya hanihaya. The Vedic statements are self-evident. Whatever is stated there must be accepted. If we interpret according to our own imagination, the authority of the Vedas is immediately lost. From the Chaitanya Charitamrita. So Lord Chaitanya is instructing this now this point. The, don't interpret, just take it as it is. The Mayavadis they are fond of interpreting everything. What does it mean? And they juggle with words and they give it some other meaning. Just like Bhagavad Gita, they will say, Dharma Kshetra, Kurukshetra, they say, oh, 
the body is Kurukshetra, and five Pandavas, this is the five senses. And in this way, they'll give so many meanings to everything, and the whole purpose is lost. But Kurukshetra is a place. It's a holy place. It's in existence. And there weren't Pandavas. There were the five Pandavas. They were not the senses. So to, when you give it all these imaginary meanings, then there's no purpose anymore in this, this knowledge. So we have to understand everything properly. Okay, someone read. Uh, 5,000 years ago, it was detected by the Lord Himself that the disciplic succession was broken, and therefore He declared that the purpose of the Gita appeared to be lost. In the same way, at the present moment also, there are so many editions of the Gita, but almost all of them are not according to the authorized disciplic succession. Okay, do you have any experience? Have you read any other editions of Bhagavad Gita before coming to Krishna Consciousness? Yes, Maharaj. <laughs> really? Gita Press Guru. Oh, Gita Press Gurupur, okay. Was it a bona fide, was it a Vaishnava interpretation or just some... Not very sure, Manans. Huh? Not very sure, Manans. I know I read one before coming to Krishna Consciousness, I didn't understand anything. I couldn't understand at all what they were talking about. I didn't get anything out of it. But Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita made sense to me. Go ahead, Prabhu, read this one. Since there is a great need of an edition of the Gita in English, as it is received by the Parampara, Disciplic Succession System, an attempt is made herewith to fulfill this great want. Bhagavad Gita, accepted as it is, is a great boon to humanity. Purport 4.2. Okay, what, what is the difference then between Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita and these other ones? Yeah, what's the difference? Why is it Prabhupada's edition was so much appreciated? Because it is as it is, uh, as received by disciplic succession, following the orders of previous acharyas. Yes, good, yes. Yeah, Prabhupada said there's a great need. There's a great need to fulfill this great, uh, presented to fulfill this great want. What did people want? People wanted to hear the genuine message. They wanted to hear the mess, the truth, presented in a manner in which everyone could understand it and apply it and accept it. Then it's a great boon to humanity. Other people write Bhagavad Gita and you have to read it, you can't understand it. And you know, if you read some scholar's book of Bhagavad Gita, one scholar in uni Oxford University wrote an edition of Bhagavad Gita, and Prabhupada had one of the sannyasis there in London at the time, he said, you go through this Bhagavad Gita and everywhere he makes a mistake. You write down, make, make a note and write to it and then send it to him and tell him everything is done wrong. <laughs> Prabhupada was so compassionate. You know, people are so... There was one man, he wrote a Bhagavad Gita in China and he said that Krishna means black, the black swan. So then he said, Krishna was sinful because Krishna encouraged the, ba the battle of Kurukshetra. So, so many people died. It was all Krishna's fault. And so he criticized Krishna. So Prabhupada said, he criticizes Krishna, but in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna criticizes him. Right? Four kinds of people never surrender unto me. Namam duskriti no mudha prapajanti naradama. So Prabhupada turned the whole thing round on him. You're criticizing Krishna. Krishna is telling you also, you're wrong. So we have to hear 
properly. Sakalini ha mahata. You know the verse? Where's it from? Who knows the verse? Sakalini ha mahata. Yoga nasta. Translation? Uh, this is about uh, the knowledge comes through discipline uh, succession. Uh, so I just remember this. Yes, the knowledge was given to the discipline succession, but what happened in course of time? was broken. The knowledge was lost, right. And there was a need to re-establish. Therefore Krishna came. Yes? So read this, what, this, what do we say here in the slide? The time is very powerful. It changes, kills the original position. You have got experience. You purchase one anything. It is very fresh, new, but time will kill it. It will become shabby. It will be useless at a time, in due course of time. Keep going. The material time, it is called Kala. Kala. This Kala is also another form of Krishna. So Kala Neva Mahata. Therefore, it is called Mahata. It is very powerful. It is not ordinary using Mahata. Its business is to destroy. Yes, its business is to destroy. Mahata. Sakaliniha Mahata. Knowledge is lost in course of time. So how did the knowledge get lost? What happened? Anybody like to say? Did it just break down in old age and fall apart? What happened? Marijee? Yes, there were, yes, there, were mis, yes there, were mis, there were misinterpretations which started. Yes. Uh, right. And that is how it diluted. Yeah, people began to deviate. They began to change everything. Misinterpretations. They went away from the parampara. They lost the connection. They started to add what was not there. Or they took out things which were there which couldn't be taken out. And so the whole thing became useless. So this is a problem. This is a danger. That in course of time, if, it change, if you change things, then you get problems. So Prabhupada always was worried, told us, don't change anything. Try to preserve everything. Keep it together. Hmm. Text number three. Marriages. Let's hear somebody read. Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Maharaj, uh, can, you, um, uh, can we relate that uh, text we read for uh, Sir Kalinya Mahatma? So, this is not been discussed. So, how it has been like uh, we are relating the material time and the Kala? Okay, it is, uh, so just wanted to understand some more of this. You wanted to understand some more of this? Yeah. How are we relating material time? This, this text that we are writing here, so Kalanirvata. Well, so, I, was, I was saying that in course of time, you know, people become, you know, they, they start to change things. They, we become a little... Sometimes we become a, a little restless and we think, well, I think I can do it, I, can, can, I think I can say it in a better way. I think I can improve on it. Okay. There, was, okay, there was one person, there was one person in the country where I go and it was a woman and she said that Krishna came in her dream and told her to write a book. And he told her that the Bhagavad Gita is already old and out of date and he wants her to write a new book to replace the Bhagavad Gita. 
And she told people like that, and she got so many followers. And so many people gave her money. <laughs> and she was such a cheat, such a rascal. To say such a thing was nonsense. So, Prabhupada said, people want to be cheated, they'll find a cheater. So, in the course of time, we do see things change. They become old. Prabhupada was saying, become shabby. So, people think like that. They think, oh, Sanskrit, no, this is out of date, this is old fashioned. We need something new, I will give a new look to it, you know. And they will put their own ideas into it. And this is the problem. They start to invent. And then they think, no, Krishna, yeah, he was, he was okay, but he was just a person. They don't understand, you know. They, they take Krishna's philosophy or Krishna's book to present their own philosophy. Prabhupada said he gave Bhagavad Gita as it is, but they want to put Bhagavad Gita as they want it, as they think it should be. They want to use Krishna's book to give their philosophy. So this is what happens in course of time. The Bhagavad Gita was known and accepted by so many people, so people took advantage of it. That they would write, they would say, this is my commentary on the Bhagavad Gita. And, and they wouldn't comment about what Krishna meant, but they would put their own philosophy in it. So this is what happens in the course of time. So many deviations come along. And we have to be very attentive and alert to know what is genuine and what is not. So this is the point. So because in course of time, you know, it's a long time between the Sun God, Krishna spoke to the Sun God 20 million years ago and 5,000 years ago, it's a long time. So, certainly things can change. I mean, we can see that in the short time Prabhupada has been with us and now how things have changed. You know, when Prabhupada was with us, our movement was really, it was really all in the ashram. Everyone was in the ashram. But it's not like that now. The whole thing has changed. So we have to expect changes, but we have to learn to live with the changes, to keep the philosophy. Prabhupada would say, the details may change, but the principles cannot change. So the principle is to follow Krishna's teachings. The details are whether it's ashram or congregation, that's the detail. Thank you. Thank you. Man. Okay, going ahead, text number three. Can we have somebody read? All right, so what's Arjuna's qualification to hear the Bhagavad Gita? Devotee plus friend. Yeah, someone may say, oh, it should be a Brahmin. I thought the Brahmins were very dear to Krishna. Is Arjuna a Brahmin? No, Maharaj. He's a Satriya. So why did Krishna give the knowledge to him? Because he has such a faith on Krishna. Okay. 
Yeah. They've been friends. They practically, they spent some, quite some time together. And they would often discuss philosophy together. They would, they, they would often discuss different teachings of the Shastras together. So when Arjuna came into the battlefield, it was not unusual for them to discuss the philosophy. So this is the relationship between Krishna and his devotees. Okay, so Arjuna has a question. Aparambhavato janma param janma vivasvataha katam itad vijaniyam tvam praktavam iti. The sun god Vivishwan is senior by birth to you. How am I to understand that in the beginning you instructed this science to him? Krishna and Arjuna are the same age. Lord Krishna would offer his obeisances to Bhima and Yudhisthira and Nakula and Sahadev would offer their obeisances to Lord Krishna. But Krishna and Arjuna would embrace each other because they were the same age. So Arjuna is puzzled when Lord Krishna said that he had instructed the knowledge to the sun god. So Arjuna's question is quite relevant. That how can I understand you? You gave the knowledge to him. It's inconceivable. And Lord Krishna, oh, okay, first of all, Prabhupada's quote, Arjuna is putting this question before the Lord is simply an attempt by the devotee to defy the atheistic attitude of persons who consider Krishna to be an ordinary human being subject to the modes of material nature. So because Arjuna is a devotee, so he's putting this question to defeat these atheistic people, these people who consider Krishna to be an ordinary person. He wants to make it clear about Krishna's absolute position. Arjuna is not in any doubt, he knows, but he wants to make it very clear to these people who don't understand Krishna and who think of Krishna as an ordinary person. So this is Arjuna's kindness, his compassion on these foolish, atheistic people. Go ahead, someone read, four, five. Bahuni me vyatitani janmani tavacharjuna tani aham veda sarvani natvam veda parantapa Many, many births both you and I have passed. I can remember all of them, but you cannot, O subduer of the enemy. Do you remember your previous births, Prabhu? No, Maharaj. You don't remember? No, Maharaj. Does anyone in our group remember your previous life? You know anything about your previous births? Did you ever do astro? Did you go to the astrologer? Did they tell you your previous life? Never did, Maharaj. <laughs> no. Prabhupada told us one time. He said that. An astrologer told him that in his previous life he had been a doctor and that he was completely pious. That was what one astrologer did. And you know, one astrologer came to Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu when Lord Chaitanya was staying in Mayapur. And Lord Chaitanya asked him, tell me who I was in my previous life. What did the, what did the astrologer say? Do you know that, Leela? Someone? Who knows that pastime? No, Maharaj. The astrologer came to Lord Chaitanya. Lord Chaitanya said, tell me, who was I in my previous life? And the astrologer did meditation and he did different things. They looked in the stars and 
checked his hand and he said, I see that in your previous life, you were the Supreme Lord, the, the, the source of everything. You were the personality of Godhead. And Lord Chaitanya said, no, I was a cowherd boy in my previous life. So, who was right? Was the astrologer wrong? No. Oh, right. And so, this, the point is, Krishna remembers all of his births. We don't remember. We forget. We don't even remember what we were doing a few hours ago. We don't remember. Our memories are so short. And so, this is... Krishna's, this is the difference between Krishna and us. Prabhupada's purport, the living entity forgets everything due to his change of body, but the Lord remembers because he does not change his Satchit Ananda body. Yeah, we change our bodies. It would be, it would be, sometimes people say, why don't we remember our previous births? How do you answer that? If somebody says to you, why don't you remember your previous life? Do you, why don't we remember? Why, why Krishna doesn't allow us to remember our previous life? He remembers, why can't we? How are you going to answer that? It is the mercy of Krishna that he is allowing us not to remember because we might have gone through so many pains in the previous life. We might have what? Gone through? We might have, go, we, we might have gone through so many tough situations, so many difficulties, so many pains. But wouldn't it be good for us to remember these things? It would be difficult for us to live now. I don't know, maybe it would be good experience for us if we remember all the troubles we had before. We can learn from these things. Maharaj, uh, material life is temporary in nature. Everything that is there in material world is temporary. So the body is temporary and our memory is also temporary. So once we change this body, we change everything and whatever is temporary is lost and then we again start from the scratch. Well, I don't know about that. We don't start from scratch. We, because the Super Soul comes with us. And the Super Soul reminds us. We may forget, but the Super Soul is there with us and reminds us about our desire from the previous life. And the previous life takes us into this life now. The body we have now is the result of the previous life. Our karma. We had these desires, and this body is the result of that. So it's not that we start from scratch, but we, 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 we continue from where we left off. But we don't remember. We don't remember because it, it, it would stop us enjoying. We wouldn't be able to enjoy the enjoyment. If we have to remember the past, we won't be able to enjoy so much this life. We're trying so hard to enjoy, we want to enjoy this body, enjoy this life. And if we have to remember the past, oh no, then we, we can't enjoy the same. So we don't like to remember, Krishna, take their, Krishna takes it away. But the Super Soul is with us and he reminds us certain things. He, and that puts us into the particular condition we're in now. Right? The karma, we carry our karma with us brings us into this situation. Here are some points from Prabhupada's purport. The difference between the Lord and the living entities. Can somebody begin reading one? Please. Srila Prabhupada Purport. In the Vedas, also it is said that the Lord, although one without a second manifests himself in innumerable forms. He is like the Vaidurya stone, which changes color yet still remains one. Have you ever seen a, a, living have you seen a stone like that? 
You have you ever seen a Vidoria stone? No, Marathi. Changes, oh, changes color, yet still remains one. Yeah, there are some, there must be stones like this, maybe there are, there are some stones around. I know they have these different stones in Rajasthan and like that, they, they do a lot of painting with them. They get different colors from them. Anyway, the stone, Prabhupada is describing to us, must, there must be this stone, may not be so many of them, but they, they change color. Maybe when the sunlight reflects, they appear with different colors. So in the same way, Krishna, although one, he can appear, he manifests in innumerable forms. He's one, but he comes in many, he is Ananta Rup, like, he has so many forms. Go ahead. Prism. prism also has different colors. Yes, right. A prism will reflect light with different colors. We can see the spectrum of colors. So when you study optics, you see all the different colors which are there in the light. So the colors are all there. It's just the different objects will reveal them. So a prism can reflect the different colors. Thank you, Maharaji. Yeah, go ahead Prabhu, read the next one. A living entity forgets everything due to his change of body. But the Lord remembers because he does not change his Satchitananda body. Hmm. Although Arjuna is addressed herein as the mighty hero who could subdue the enemies, he is unable to recall what had happened in his various past births. Arjuna, Therefore, now wait, wait, Arjuna is addressed as mighty, mighty hero. He could subdue the enemy, but he's unable to recall what had happened in his various passports. So although he's, although he's so mighty, he could defeat his enemy. He's Maharati, he's a great fighter, he could defeat the enemy. But the... That may be to his credit, but he, he cannot recall about previous births. Of course, we know something about Arjuna's previous... What, what Arjuna is... Uh, well, he's born from this, the semen of Indra, son of Indra in the womb of Kunti. So he has a, a great birth. So he must have had... In previous life, he must have had some very good position, certainly. Oh, Krishna, what's it? Yeah. Okay, go ahead, Prabhu, finish off. Therefore, the Lord and the living entity can never be equal in all respects, even if the living entity is as liberated as Arjuna. So even Arjuna, he's not able to remember, and Arjuna is on a much greater position than us. Arjuna is like a liberated soul. He's a very great soul, he's, and he's a friend of Lord Krishna, he's a devotee of Lord Krishna, but he doesn't remember his previous births. Now somebody, some people may want to, well, we should know about our previous birth. Well, if we needed to know, Krishna would have let us know. We, it's not important. What is important is our future birth. The past, that's over with. We should think about the future. Where do you want to take your next birth? That's important. Where are we going from here? It's not where we came from, it's where we're going. That's important. So Arjuna, he doesn't remember. If Arjuna doesn't remember, then how will we ever be able to remember? So these are some little distinctions between the Lord and the living entity. The Lord is infinite and we are infinitesimal. We are very small. He is very great. So big difference between us and the Lord. 
Prabhupada said, how God can forget? If you forget, then you are not God immediately. There is no other argument. God cannot forget. God remembers always. Prabhupada said one time, he said, just think how busy Krishna must be. He's the super soul in the hearts of all living entities. So he's not only thinking about his own, but he's thinking about everyone else. He remembers about everyone. As a super soul, he carries the, the remembrance for us into the next life. We forget, but super soul doesn't forget. Krishna is there to remind us what is our desire. So he doesn't, Krishna doesn't go, go through any transformations. We go through transformations, changing bodies. From Prabhupada's lecture on this section of the fourth chapter, the Mayavadi philosopher says that I am God. Now I am under illusion of Maya. I have forgotten myself that I am God and by meditation I shall become God. This is all nonsense. Nobody. God cannot forget himself. Then he is not God. So how do you defeat a Mayavadi philosopher? Prabhupada's giving us a good argument. Right? What, what, what would you say to the Mayavadi philosopher? How will you argue against him? Yes? We, we can ask for his previous book. Yes, simply. And if he says, well, my previous life I was a demigod, what would you say? I would like to, to say, then you, you just try to lift up to 200 kg. <laughs> well, that was in my previous life, but now I'm a human being. I'm not a demigod anymore. Then you are not a god. Oh. Because, because Lord is embodiment. Lord's body is not the uh, material body. He, so so uh, you, you, you cannot be a, you cannot have a material body like that. So you are not a, you are not God. You cannot be a God. Mm -hmm. Well, I can be a, I can be a, a, a human God. Can I be a God in the humans? I am God. No. But there is no no um, anything written in uh, shastras. Every every birth of God, even the upcoming birth of uh, the God is uh, mentioned in the shastras. Then where is your name? Well, God has many names. Does my name have to be there? My name doesn't have to be there. God has so many names. He can't put all the names in the Shastra. Like this. Why, should I, why should I believe you? Anything you can do so that I can believe you? Well, it's up to give, you. Give me, give me some benediction that I could become uh, uh, 400 crore, 1,000 1, crore rupees. Well, it's up to you if you believe me or not. I'm trying to help you. I, I mean, if you don't want to, you know, I give, I give everyone free will, you know. I don't force you. If you don't want to believe in me, it's okay, you know. I don't force you, you know. I have to be merciful as God, you know, I have to give you your, your free will. You don't want to believe in me. In the future, in the future, you'll think more about it. You'll come back and surrender to me. I am surrendering unto you. I am believing you now. I was bewildered, but I want some benedictions from your side. Okay, I benedict you. In the future, you will become my devotee. No, no, no. I believe in present. 
who who else uh, no future what what will be your future the future well it, the future it's all the same you know the future the past it's all one everything is one you know you can know my past if you are you are god so you must be knowing my past your past yes and your past life you were a dog and you were a hog no 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 in present life uh, 20 years like 20 years. Maraj, can we say that uh, krishna claims that uh, I, i will take away all your sinful reactions so uh, why don't you take all i have surrendered unto you uh, take away all my sinful reactions and uh, so that i can become liberated now Yes. Well, okay. I'll take away your sinful when reaction. You, how will you get to know that your sinful reactions are gone away? How can you know? Yes. You are not from like when you are. Uh, when you surrender unto me, then you know your sinful reactions are all taken away. How should I believe, Maraji? Well. that's what i say I, i can't force you to believe in me if you don't want to believe in me what can i do you know But some Krishna some people are lots of things that that's why people believed him shri ram ji did a lots of things that's why lot of people everybody believed him hanuman ji did lots of things but what what extra qualification you have that should i believe you 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 don't see it? by my power the sun is rising every day by my power the wind is blowing by my power you get air to breathe it's all going on under my direction you cannot see you cannot see how my i'm working but i'm i'm the i'm behind this whole creation so then maraj uh, just like krishna he stopped the the setting of the sun in mahabharat for some time when arjuna wanted to fight so we can ask that particular person to stop the rising of the sun or the setting of the sun for some time oh, i have to do that just for you just to convince you about me i have to stop the setting of the sun no no come on i'm not going to do Mar that. i'm not going to maraj yes Uh, brahma ji said in uh, brahma saita adyam puran purusham navayovanam cha the god is beat any form uh, advaita machitam anadi anant rupam beat any roop beat any form the god will always be navayovanam cha but we can see you don't have any hairs and you are growing old so the god doesn't grow old he is always navayovanam cha well this is just my leela growing old and no hair this is my leela prabhu I'm just this is just my leela to bewilder people. There are so many human god existing in this material world but there is only one god because you know the leela of god is seen to everyone. So there is just one god, Ishara Parama Krishna. Yeah. He has a Satchidananda Vigra and he is the beginning of everything. So there cannot be many gods. There is nothing no such statement like human god. and there can only be one god if there is so many god then they are demi gods not god so god can only be one but, but because he is the supreme but i'm telling you everything is one it's all one we're all we're all god that you have not realized it yet i've realized it yeah we we, we may be we may be uh, quantitatively but not qualitatively no that is your this that is your vision but i'm telling you ultimately we're all one is all just brahman you are brahman i am brahman everything is brahman we're all the supreme we're all god you can go on, remember you can go on like this arguing endlessly you have to understand very difficult dealing with this kind of people they will always come back with some answer some nonsense that it's not a very yes, good idea to get into arguments with people because they will always come up with some nonsense philosophy sometimes we may take the trouble but it's not really worth it the best way to preach to people is by sankirtan the chanting of the holy name and also prasadam you know let them chant hari krishna and take prasadam we can give so many arguments it would go on we get nowhere but chanting hari krishna the sound of the sankirtan 
and Krishna Prasadam, and then there's some hope for people. So with, I saw Prabhupada, he spent so much time talking to one man one morning in the temple in London, and the man was arguing and going back and forth. Prabhupada was preaching to him. Prabhupada was preaching to him for our benefit. He was showing us how we could defeat his arguments. And the man was not accepting. So then Prabhupada went for a morning walk. And then when Prabhupada came back from the morning walk, he came by the temple room and he saw the man was in the kirtan and he was chanting and dancing. And so Prabhupada said, you see, this is, this is how people can benefit most in Kali Yuga. He said, Sankirtan, everyone can get the benefit quickly, easily. But just arguing, debating, we get nowhere, waste so much time. Okay, we'll go ahead. So the mystery of... Thank you for giving us such a nice experience. Yes, thank you for your participation. Thank okay, you. we're going ahead here. Mystery of the Lord's appearance. A little exercise for you. Identify points relevant for establishing the mystery of Lord's appearance from Bhagavad Gita. 4, 6 to 10. Pay special attention to... Sanskrit words, phrases, and analogies. All right, how many people do we have in the class today? How many are here today? Eleven. Eleven, okay. So, what will we have? Uh, groups, how many people? Uh, can we have four, four groups? One group of three. Okay. And one maybe four. Three and four. Eleven How people. Many? How many groups? No, four. Four groups, yeah. Okay. See what you can come up with here? The mystery of the Lord's appearance. What is the mystery? Um, Yes, go ahead, we'll break up. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Six to ten, yeah. Six to ten, yeah. Look, look. Just maybe take a verse each and pick out some points. Okay. Okay, Marat. So in four point six, uh, Krishna says, although I'm unborn, my transcendental body never de deteriorates, and although I'm the Lord of all living entities, I'm still appearing. Every millennium in my original transcendental form. Yes, ma'am, it is so. Prabhupada writing in the book for that person may be like an ordinary person. But the Lord is unborn. And uh, his body never deteriorates. Because he got a transcendental body. Yes, right. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. It's a mystery. In what way is it transcendental? Because he appears in every millennium in his same original transcendental form. Okay. 
So he, his form never grows old, never deteriorates. Yeah. I understand. Verse 5 also have given a Brahm Samhita references also. Krishna can explain to me. Recording in progress. Yes, so let's start with text six. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Are you okay? Are you managing to get some points? We're trying to define the word mystery, Maharaj. How to apply the word mystery in this? <laughs> well, there's so many mysterious things about Lord Krishna, right? Krishna is a mystery. His birth is a mystery. He takes birth though he's unborn and he's, he appears again and again. He never grows old. The body is not subject to change. Okay. There's so many... So it's more, to, it's more towards the nature of Krishna's uh, appearance, right? Yes, uh, well Krishna's appearance and his activities. Just uh, just points which are given there in the purport. Pick, up, pick out some things from the purport which Prabhupada mentions. You know, you, not just from your own understanding. Read through Prabhupada's purport and see some points which Prabhupada's making about Krishna, which are mysterious, which are like different from everybody else, which almost inconceivable that Krishna can do like this. Uh, one thing that Maharaj we can understand is the word Prakriti over here. Prakriti yeah. means, in text 6, Prakriti means Lord's own Saru. So, you know, every time when the Lord comes, He comes in His own original form. You know, the whereas all the other living entity, they keep on changing their body. For an example, if I'm in a male body, next time I may be in a female body or it may be some other species. But you know, whenever the Lord comes, He comes in His own form. So He never changes His body. So that is what Prabhupada is trying to, that is what Prabhupada is mentioning with that word Prakriti in His purport. Okay. So that's one of the mystery. Yeah. Yeah, good. Prakriti. The second point is again that Nava Yovanam Although, whereas everyone else who was there with Krishna, their body was deteriorating and growing old. But Krishna, although he was 125 year old at the time of battle at Kurukshetra, he was still looking like 16 year old boy. So that is again another mystery. Okay. Yes. Recording in progress. Good 
Can you find me? I'm not Jeeper Boo. Maharaj, uh, how much uh, time we are giving? Like, when yeah, should but just, I'm just about to close the groups now. Are you ready? Okay, Maharaj. Okay. But we cannot find the analogy, Maharaj. Couldn't find any a analogies there? Well, maybe... Uh, uh, Is there any other groups they found? Must be some analogies there. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Is it in 4.6, Maharaj? And it says here, actually his appearance and disappearance are like the sun rising moving before us then disappearing from our eyesight yeah when the sun is out of sight we think the sun is set when the sun is before our eyes we think that the sun is on horizon actually the sun is always fixed position oh. but due owing to our defect in sufficient senses we calculate the appearance and disappearance of the sun in the sky okay yeah yeah there's yeah. your analogy <laughs> Good. Recording in progress. Okay, we will close the groups now, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Sahasra Tirtha Prabhu. Okay, so everyone's back. So can, would someone like to begin with the contribution? Group number one, spokesman. Yes, who's in group one? Hare Krishna, can you hear me? Yes, you can hear. Who's in group? Yeah, no. Who was in group number who one? Group, who was in group one? Yes, I was that group at Paracha. Actually, I'm having to come with that. Yes. What did you just come up with? Something. One point. Give me one point. Yes. So actually, Lord does not take birth. He manifests. He doesn't. Like, uh, he doesn't take birth. He manifests himself. His body is not like our body, which uh, uh, decays over the period of time. Okay. His body is, is in a position form, such as the Right. Okay. Good point. Thank you. His body doesn't take birth. He, rather, he just manifests himself. Was there any example to support that? Yeah, yes. Yes. What was the example? Uh, in 4.6, although I am unborn and untranslated body, never deteriorates, and although I, I am the Lord of all sentient beings, I still appear in every minute in my original translated form. In 4.6, uh, in translation, Lord is saying Himself. Yes, but there's an, uh, there's an analogy given in the purport. Krishna Premi. Hare Krishna Maharaj. 
analogy. Yes, what was that analogy you came up with? Yeah, it's in uh, Maharaj is in 4.6. It's written by Srila Prabhupada in the Prophet that uh, Krishna's appearance and disappearance are like the sun rising and moving before us and then disappearing from our eyesight. When the sun is out of sight, we think that the sun is set and that when the sun is before our eyes, we think that the sun is on the horizon. Actually, the sun is always in its fixed position, but owing to our defective insufficient senses, we calculate the appearance and disappearance of the sun in the sky. Mm. And because Lord Krishna's appearance and disappearance are completely different from any ordinary common living entity, it's evidence that he is eternal blissful knowledge by his eternal potency and he is never contaminated by material nature. Okay, thank you. So, in relation to Krishna not taking birth, he manifests himself and his manifestation is compared to the rising and setting of the sun. Just like when the sun appears, it's not a new sun. It's not the sun taking birth. The sun is always there. In the same way, Lord Krishna is always there. But just that he is appearing before us. But he's always, he's always there. But now he's manifesting himself. When he appeared 5,000 years ago, he manifested himself. And then after 125 years, then the sun set. He was unmanifest. So his appearance is like that. It's not, that's a mystery, right? So that's a, 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 an important point to understand. Some other, any other principles? Group two, do you have anything else? Hare Krishna Maharaj, no. here is one more point that the Lord appears in his own body and he does not change body like the common living entity appears in different kinds of bodies in different births. All right, he appears in his own body, he doesn't change his body. Okay, this, yes, Prabhu, go ahead. Tell, uh, us, tell us about Prakriti. Uh, so I didn't know that I was unmuted. Prakriti is what has been explained in the text, Maharaj, in the, in the verse, that Prakriti means his own Saru. So the Krishna comes in his own Saru in every millennium. And then uh, after this, what has been explained is you know, the Ajapi, Ajapi means the normal individual takes birth as per their karma. But uh, Krishna, uh, this rule doesn't apply on Krishna. So that's, that's again a mystery. Krishna is Avyatma. Uh, so he comes in his own natural explained as, you know, that, like Brahma Saita, Brahma Jai is saying, uh, saying that Navi Yoganam Chum, Krishna is always you. So, here also Prabhupada is writing that, you know, Krishna, although at the time of war, he was 125 year old, but he was looking like a young boy, and Navi Yoganam So, whereas everyone else who has taken birth, at, uh, you know, at the same time, is growing old, their body is being det deteriorating, but Krishna body is always uh, youthful. Navayovanamcha. Okay. So Krishna is Navayovana. He's eternally youthful. Any other points? Other groups? Group three? Or group four? Anything else not you came up with which we've not covered? Uh, Lord Krishna appeared to re establish a religion and also he, Krishna also teaches us how to come back to him. He says that uh, being free from attachment, fear, and anger in 4.10 Maharaj. 4.10. Yeah, being free from attachment, fear, and anger. What's the point? What's the mystery there? Because Krishna was telling in the past, many, many persons in the past have become purified 
by knowledge of Krishna means Krishna is not an ordinary person. Oh. He can so we put that point on that. All right. Yes, if they have knowledge of me or you, you know, that wouldn't purify them. But knowledge of Krishna, they become purified. So that's something very special. Yes. Very good. Thank you. Okay. We'll go ahead. Uh. Okay. Okay, from the purport of text number seven. Solution to communal riots. Communal riots. Huh? We get this from time to time. Uh, he can manifest himself. He can manifest himself anywhere and everywhere. And whenever he desires to appear, in each and every incarnation, he speaks as much about religion as can be understood by the particular people under their particular circumstances. But the mission is the same, to lead people to God consciousness and obedience to the principles of religion. Sometimes he descends personally and sometimes he sends his bona fide representative in the form of his son or servant or himself in some disguised form. So Prabhupada is speaking about how the Lord is expert in presenting his mission, leading people to God consciousness. The teacher has to know the level of the students and he has to be able to speak on the level in which the students can understand. So Prabhupada is explaining like that here, that he will come at different times, just like we see the example Lord Buddha. Lord Buddha is an incarnation of the Lord and he comes and he, he doesn't teach about God and he doesn't teach about the Vedas. He leads people away. He doesn't even teach about the soul. He just, he just teaches the people non-violence, do good, don't do any bad things like that, G give up desires, because the people were atheists. So he, he knows what to teach according to their level. And then we have people like Prophet Muhammad and Jesus Christ, how they also did great good for the people, although they were teaching and in, in fallen in the societies which were very irreligious and fallen, but still they were able to bring them to God consciousness. So Prabhupada gave a lot of credit like that to Prophet Muhammad and to Jesus Christ, that they could instill some God consciousness within their followers. So this is the expertise of Lord Krishna. Sometimes he sends people and sometimes he comes himself disguised. And sometimes he comes personally, as he did 5,000 years ago, revealing himself as the supreme absolute truth. Is that all right? Any questions on this? We'll go ahead. Three reasons for Lord Krishna's appearance. Text number eight. Paritranaya sadunam, vinas chaya shajuskritam, dharma samstarpanartaya. So three reasons. To deliver the pious, to annihilate the miscreants, to re-establish the principles of religion. All right, there's nothing much there. That's quite a simple point. Oh, wait. Bhagavad Gita 4.9 Janma karma chame divyam evam yo veti tadvada tadvadi ham punar janma naiti mamiti so arjuna. Uh, Prabhupada said one time, this is the most important verse in the Bhagavad Gita. Are you surprised? 
Why would this be the most important verse in the Bhagavad Gita? Can anybody answer? Krishna Premi Maharaji, why is this the most important verse in the Bhagavad Gita? Um, because the Lord uh, reassuring and telling every every living entity that uh, one who know whoever knows have knowledge of him, his transcendental nature of his activities, his experience uh, activities and appearance means Bhagavad Gita and Srima Bhagavad does not leave uh we need to get this knowledge because other upon leaving the body no one they cannot take birth again in this material world no one can give this kind of assurance Maharaj unless it's a supreme personality of God. Yes we don't want to take birth again. We want to yes. get out from the material world. So Krishna yes. is saying Takvadi Hampanarjanma Naiti Mamiti no, you won't take a birth again. Oh, this is very special. What, what is the qualification? We have to understand the janma and the karma. What do we need to understand about Krishna's birth and activities? We have to understand that it is divyam, it is transcendental. Yes. That is the point. We have to know this is transcendental. Lord's appearance in this world is not of this world. It is all transcendental. So very, very interesting verse, very important verse. And how much do we need to know? <laughs> how much do we need to know about Krishna's birth and activities? Well, the more, the more you know, the better. We have, to, we have to develop an attraction for hearing and remembering. Of course, we're celebrating Krishna's birth tomorrow, so the, the Lord's appearance is there. We, we celebrate it. We, we should be thinking, meditating on it. how did He appear, how did He come. Or we, heard, we heard today, He doesn't take birth, He manifests Himself. Hmm? How did He manifest Himself? It describes from the heart of Vasudev, he appeared in the heart of Devaki. And then from the heart of Devaki, from the womb of Devaki. He came from the womb of Devaki. Did Krishna have to appear in the womb of Devaki? He's always there. He's everywhere. Krishna's everywhere. And so he doesn't have to go there. He's, always, he's everywhere. He's in everything. So he just manifests himself, he manifested himself in the womb of Devaki. And then he came, he manifested himself out externally, out of the womb of Devaki. Just as you see in the illustration, Lord Krishna is there in his forearm form before Vasudev and Devaki. And they're praying to him. So, we want to understand the Lord's transcendental nature. It's very important to understand this. If we understand this fact, we will never have to come back again in this world. We just have, we have to have this complete conviction that this is the Lord. Prabhupada comments, evam yo veti tattvataha. Now, here the word tattvata is very important. Tadvataha is the science of Krishna and Krishna and means and means in truth. It is not enough to know by historical facts that Krishna is born on such and such date, in such and such place, in such and such family, and that he did such and such activities. One has to learn them in tattvata, in truth. Then he becomes free from the bodily entanglement. How one can understand the science of Krishna? It is explained in the 18th chapter that Krishna science can be understood by devotional service. So, Prabhupada is encouraging us 
to learn uh, in truth, in learn the tattva, the, the, the Krishna tattva, how Krishna appears in this world. We have to get out of this material world, we have to get free from this identification with the material body. And don't put a material identification on Krishna, but understand Lord Krishna, how he is completely transcendental to this material world. So Prabhupada is saying, it's not enough, it's, it's not enough to just know Oh, he's born in Mathura, oh, he's in the Yadu family, he's born in the Yadu dynasty, he's the son of Vasudev and Devaki, dang, dang. like this, no, you could go on, so many facts. But we have to learn in truth, not in the bodily in entanglement. So we have to understand this, the science purposes, understand the science by devotional service. What do we need to know? We have to develop that faith, that love in the in Lord Krishna. That we want we, we, we just feel so much attachment for Krishna. We become anxious to hear about Krishna and to remember him. We don't want, just want to be a, a historian and collect the facts or collect all the information. The information is not going to be enough. That's not going to help us go back to Godhead. We've got to develop that deep attachment to Krishna. So that attachment, of course, part of the attachment comes by hearing about him. Okay, coming on to text number 10, eternal nature of his birth and activities. Someone can read? Tosi Krishna Priya Mataji, you read. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Vita Raga Bhaya Kroda Man Maya Mampas Rita Bahavo Jana Tapasya Puta Mad Bhavam Agata Being Freed from attachment, fear and anger, being fully absorbed in me and taking refuge in me, many, many persons in the past become purified by knowledge of me and thus they all attend transcendental love for me. Thank you. So, this is three things we have to be get freed from. Attachment, fear and anger, right? <laughs> What's the fear? What is the fear? Fear of? Anyone? Uh, huh? Fear of uh, born again in this material world. <laughs> yeah, fear of being born again, fear of having a material identity, yeah? And what's the anger due to? Lust. <laughs> Well, why do we get angry? What's it, what's it, what made us angry? Not necessarily always lust. Something, there was a, what caused the anger? Uh, I'm sorry, can't hear you very well, Madhuji. Not able to control our senses, that's why we get angry. Well, there was another reason actually given, Prabhupada writes in the purport. Prabhupada, the anger due to frustration. You're looking for the truth, but you find so many people cheating and so many people giving different opinions and they're all trying to cheat and exploit us. So we become angry out of frustration and trying to find the truth. So this is a cause of anger, that's how, how Prabhupada explains it. And the attachment, attachment to sense gratification. So we have to become free from these things, become absorbed in Krishna, take refuge in Krishna, and pure, by knowledge of Krishna we get purified 
and we get love for Krishna. So this is one process which we can come to Krishna, understand the nature of his birth and activities. Three obstacles for bhakti. Some people are too materially attached, raga, right? Materially attached, the senses are very strong, many desires. And therefore, do not give attention to spiritual life. So that's the attachment. Some of them want to merge into the supreme spiritual cause out of fear of personal spiritual identity, bhaya. Yeah, we think, oh, I, I'm a person now in this world and I'm suffering so much and I have so many problems. If I have to be a person in the spiritual world also, there must be more problems. So oh, I, I don't know if I want to be a person. So we may have fear of being a person, of having a spiritual identity. Because we have so much experience with our own identity here in the material world, and we think if I have spiritual identity, I'll have more problems, eternal problems. So I, I don't know if I want that. So that, that people have a fear of that identity. And some of them disbelieve in everything, being angry, Kroda at all, at all sorts of spiritual speculation out of hopelessness. You know, they just become fed up with everything. Oh, these people, they think, oh, religion, the opium of the people. And you know, this is how Karl Marx described it. And this philosophy was taken up by all the communist countries and they like very much this statement that religion is the opium of the people and they put down all the religion because they saw so much, uh, so many problems had come in their countries due to the different religious groups who had all come there to so-called propagate or but, um, uh, do their missionary work in their country but they brought so much corruption and so much, so many bad things in the name of religion. So three obstacles of bhakti, raga or attachment, bhaya, fear and krodha, anger. Prabhupada explains from the purport, to get free from these three stages of the material concept of life, one has, to make com one has to take complete shelter of the Lord, guided by the bona fide spiritual master, and follow the disciplines and regulative principles of devotional life. So this is important. But, of course, there are challenges, right? What's the challenge? What, what's the challenge? Can you see any challenge there? Maharaj, complete surrender. Yes, that's... People, people do surrender, but not completely. Okay. Well, even if they surrender a bit, that's good. I think the challenge is to get the bona fide spiritual master. That's a challenge. There's so many others. There's so many not bona fide spiritual masters. There's so many people, they're not spiritual masters, but they come in the guise of spiritual masters. So that's a challenge, getting the genuine process, following the disciplines and regulative principles, that's another challenge. You may have a genuine spiritual master, we may not be able to follow the disciplines and regulative principles. Just like Prabhupada said, chant 16 rounds, how many people can do it? It's a challenge. Prabhupada said, Four regulated principles, 
How many people can do it? It's a, it's, these are problems. Sometimes, some people even say, oh, it's too difficult. Prabhupada said, not difficult, but some people say, oh, very difficult. Four principles. They say, if it was only three principles, it would be so much better. We could have many devotees. If we didn't have to chant 16 rounds, it would be so much better. If we just chant four rounds, it would be much better. The prob what would be the problem if we did that? If we made three principles and only four rounds, then what would happen? That will become difficult one day. Huh? That will become difficult one day. That will become uh, difficult one day? Yeah, I mean, uh, you keep diluting and that becomes the standard and that again becomes difficult. And, and then they say, four, why four, four rounds is too difficult? We should just chant two rounds. And, yeah, and four, three principles is too much. We should just do two principles. Yep, but I see the problem is there will be no pure devotees. Nobody will be a pure devotee. When you follow four principles and chant 16 rounds, that's pure devotion. That's the standard of pure devotion. But if you're not going to follow that, then there are no pure devotees. Nobody's a pure devotee. But following the four principles and chanting 16 rounds, everyone's a pure devotee. Everyone, there's a movement of pure devotees. Prabhupada wants the Krishna Consciousness Movement to be a movement of pure devotees. So we get trained to follow the disciplines, to follow the principles, because that's the level of pure devotion. And on the platform of pure devotion, then we can present Krishna Consciousness to others. But if we're not pure ourselves, then how can we present Krishna Consciousness to others? So we have to do what we practice, what we preach, right? Everyone understand? You agree? Yes, Maharaj. Yes? Okay. Krishna as the goal of all paths and creator of Varnashram, 11 to 15. Maharaj, I had a doubt. Okay, Prabhu, let's hear your doubt. Maharaj, in the tenth verse in the purport, uh, Prabhupada, he says that how the impersonalists, when they talk about uh, merging with the Supreme, they give this example of uh, how the living entities are like the bubbles in the ocean and the bubbles, they get merged into the ocean. So, uh, uh, Prabhupada is not specifically giving a point to refute this. So, uh, is there anything specific we should keep in mind to refute this particular point of impersonalists, Maharaj? Yes, uh, when you read the Nectar of Devotion, it's discussed a little bit. And Prabhupada, Prabhupada just said, this is not a very good example, we don't like this. We say that there are so many aquatic creatures which come from the rivers and flow into the sea, and they keep their individuality, they keep their identity. They give the example, all the rivers flow into the ocean, become one with the sea. But we say but there's many aquatic creatures swimming in the rivers, they come into the ocean, they keep their individuality, they don't become one, and they go deep in the ocean. So we give that example. The, 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 the rivers flow into the sea, but what happens, the water is evaporated from the sea into the clouds, and then the clouds bring the water, pour it back onto the land. And it comes on, the, and then it falls down the, in, in the rain, it comes, as, as rain, it falls down on the mountains, it flows through the mountains into the rivers, comes back to the sea. And so that's, that's not liberation, just going into the sea. But the, the living entities, the aquatics, they come into the ocean, they dive deep into the ocean, they stay in the ocean. They don't go back into the, the rivers. Understand? Yes, Maharaj. Thank you. Okay, so text number 11. Lord is equal to all. Who's not read yet? Someone, please. Yes? Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. 
Lord is equal to all. Dia tama prapatiyante tamstat taiva bajami aham anavart manovartante manusya parta sarvasaha. As all surrenders unto me are reward them accordingly. Everyone follows my path in all respects. O son of Buddha, O one your loving. Okay, how can this be misunderstood, Madhiji? How would this verse be misunderstood? Where would there be some problem with academic integrity here? Maybe uh, in terms of how Krishna will reward someone once they, they surrender to Krishna. Krishna may reward them accordingly as they surrender unto me. And so, you're saying... Maybe one may misunderstand this little system of reward by uh, mentioned by Krishna here, Maharaj. Okay. Yeah, the question of reward. Maybe. Do we want some reward? That's a possibility, yeah? A reward so, obviously, them. people, I think, they will, uh, they will try to... Uh, I don't know, not in terms of imitating, they, they will try to surrender in a sense, like, they know there will be some reward given to them. Okay. So they will be, like, more towards the rewarding purpose of the surrender. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one point. Anybody else can see another? Maraj, I see that uh, when uh, we are saying everyone follows my path in all respects, which uh, someone would misinterpret that whatever path we follow will lead to Krishna. Yes, right. Yeah. Everyone follows my path. Everyone follows my path. No, it's, it's all one. <laughs> you see, this is this, uh, a Dvaita philosophy. You can see how this comes in here. Everyone follows my path in all respect. So they say, it's all one. It's all the same. Krishna doesn't mind different paths. It's all the same. Everyone follows my path. So, <laughs> but look at the first part of the verse. Krishna is saying something a little, not, he's not, he's not saying it's all one. He said, as you surrender, I reward you accordingly. So as you surrender, as you follow, you get the results. As much as you follow, you will get that much back. You don't get what you don't deserve. You get the results. So you, you have to be careful. Krishna is equal to everyone. Yeah, he's equal to everyone, but it doesn't mean everyone gets the same thing. Everyone gets according to their qualification to receive. What's the example Prabhupada gives? Anybody? That Krishna is equal to everyone, but still? He shows partiality to? The surrender devotees. Yes. Prabhupada said, just like a mother, a mother is kind to all children, but you have a special affection for? For who? Krishna Premi. Mm. The mother has more affection for those children who follows her instructions yeah uh, and, uh, it should be a, should should be her own child right <laughs> and her own child yeah. <laughs> right yes naturally the mother likes all children but she especially like her own be concerned for her own child yeah but your point is also good that the father you know he he's equal to all his sons but the son who is obedient to him and who does, who carries out his instructions, then the father will be especially kind to him, because that son takes the instructions of the father seriously, and the other sons they don't worry. So the father takes special interest in the son who is obedient. So Krishna is equal to everyone, but to those who are faithful and who are obedient to him and follow his instructions, then Krishna gives special interest to them. That will come up later in the ninth chapter. Okay, here's a section from fourth chapter purport. The Lord is never partial to any living entity. As for those who are impersonalists, 
and who want to commit spiritual suicide by annihilating the individual existence of the living entity, Krishna helps also by absorbing them into his effulgence. Such impersonalists do not agree to accept the eternal, blissful personality of Godhead. Consequently, they cannot relish the bliss of transcendental personal service to the Lord, having extinguished their individuality. So, Krishna also helps these people get what they want. They want to become one. They want to give up their individuality. Krishna facilitates it. He gives them that impersonal liberation. They don't want a spiritual form. So Krishna, okay, just enter into the Brahman, become one in the, in the Maya Fulgens. This is how Krishna shows. He is equal to everyone according to their interests, according to what they want. Some of them who are not firmly situated, even in the impersonal existence, return to this material field to exhibit their dormant desires for activities. They are not admitted into the spiritual planets, but they are again given a chance to act on the material planet. All right. Some impersonalists, they get impersonal liberation, but they're not comfortable there, they're not firmly situated, they come back. Their liberation is not complete. They've got theoretical liberation, but they still have some desires for activities. So they come back to the material world. There's a verse about this in Srimad Bhagavatam. Arora Krishrena Parampatam Tata Patanti Ado Nidreta Yasmadangraya. Right? Persons who think their intelligence is purified, but who still have some contamination there, they come back again into the material world and they take birth again. And they they're given a chance again to act in the material world. They're, they're not able to go into the spiritual world. They don't have the qualification. Uh, Maharaj. Uh, yes? So Maharaj, for those impersonalists who are firmly situated in the effulgence, are they eternally there or do they get any more chance to understand the personal form also? Well, they, have, they do get some chance that sometimes the Sankirtan movement devotees go past there, sometimes the Lord's devotees are going by doing Kirtan, and if they're in the impersonal Brahman, and if they're attracted to the Sankirtan movement, they may be able to go. But usually you find they're not too much attracted to the Sankirtan movement. So they will stay there, and unless it They'll stay there, usually they'll stay there until they get so bored or so tired of the, the nothingness or, or the oneness and the no activity and no relationships, no variety, then they, then they will come back to the material world. When they start to feel the, the need for some more variety, some more activities, because the nature of that impersonal activity, impersonal liberation, no activities. So when they get tired of that, then they will either go back to the material world, or they may be lucky, they may be attracted to some devotees who are going to the spiritual world. Because some devotees, they're going, they're leaving the material world, they're going through the Brahma, Brahma Jyoti into the spiritual planets. So they may be attracted to join with the devotees, but not very common, not very common. Okay, Lord is equal to all. For those who are fruit of workers, the Lord awards the desired results of their prescribed duties as a Yagneshwara, 
And those who are yogis seeking mystic powers are awarded such powers. In other words, everyone is dependent for success upon his mercy alone. And all kinds of spiritual processes are but different degrees of success on the same path. Unless, therefore, one comes to the highest perfection of Krishna consciousness, all attempts remain imperfect. All right? They're all imperfect. There's a verse in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, Akama sarvakamo va moksha kama udharadi tivrena bhakti yogena yajeta purusham param. So it doesn't matter if you're, and you have all material desires or no material desires or you desire liberation, whatever you desire, you will not be peaceful. But if you're a devotee of Krishna, then you'll be peaceful. One who has devotion for Krishna, he's peaceful, he's satisfied. The fruit of worker, they want to enjoy the results of their work. The yogis, they want mystic powers. Everyone wants something for their, for their enjoyment. So Prabhupada said, they're depending on Krishna's mercy for their enjoyment. So these, they appear to be spiritual processes, but different levels of success. You get mystic power, oh, very spiritual. Oh, you're a great yogi, very spiritual. Or you're a jnani, you've got, you're free of material desires. Oh, great, great scholar, great yogi. See no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, no activity, right? Very renounced and detached from the world, doing great austerities. This is not perfection. The real perfection is to come to Krishna consciousness, because only in Krishna consciousness will be peaceful. But Krishna facilitates everyone according to their desires. Prabhupada explains, Krishna reciprocates according to each person's desire. To the karmi, he awards the desired result of their prescribed duties. To the jnani, he allows them to enter his impersonal effulgence. To the yogi, he gives mystic powers. And for the pure devotee, he gives the opportunity of loving service in his personal association. So according to their desires, you get what you want, according to your qualification. Krishna is equal to everyone. He awards them according to their own desire. In order to achieve their desired success, then, why do people choose to worship others instead of Krishna? It's a good question. In order to achieve their success, why do people worship others instead of Krishna? Does anybody know the answer? You'd like to guess? Krishna may not always award uh, what is desired from the jiva because he is a loving father, so he knows what to give and what not to. But if the demigods, uh, they are asked for, even if it is not uh, something good for us, we may get it because it is their duty to give. Yes. Why do people worship others than Krishna then? To get what they want. Is that what you're saying? Yes, yes, Maharaj. Let's see. The rarity of worshipper of Krishna. Kanchanta karmanam siddhim yagnanta iha devata shipramhi manushi loke 
Sadir Bhavati Karmaja. Men in this world desire success in fruit of activity and therefore they worship the demigods. Quickly, of course, men get results from fruit of work in this world. Yes, worship the demigods quick. Lord, Lord Shiva is Asutosh, easily pleased, easily satisfied. Quickly you can get results. Lord Krishna, not so easy. Lord Vishnu, not so easy, it takes more time. They're more cautious but to give blessings. But the devas, quickly, they get results. So people like quick things, everything, they think everything should be quick. Chatur varnam maya shistam guna karma vibhagasha tasya karanam apimam vidya kartaram avyayam According to the three modes of material nature, the work associated with them, the four divisions of human society are created by me and although I am the creator of this system, you should know that I am yet the non-doer, being unchangeable. So the three modes of nature are associated with the four divisions, the four varnas, according to guna and karma, according to work and qualities. The work associated with them, the guna, that's the karma, and the guna, the qualities. So it's not janma, janma, it's not janma karma viva, it's guna karma viva vishnu. So it's not just simply by birth, but we have to see the quality and the work of a person to understand this particular varna. So Krishna created this system to engage people, to keep people occupied, give them some work, they, they can be happy and satisfy their nature according to their nature. So Krishna created this system, uh, guna karma, chatur varnam maya shristam. Krishna said, I created it. People criticize it and say it's not fair. But Krishna created it fairly, it's just people didn't apply it fairly. They made it by birth instead of by guna and karma. But it's a very fair system. In every society, in every part of the world, there is the intellectual class, the Brahman, there's the administrative class, the Kshatriya, there's the business class, the Vaishya, and there's the laborer, the worker. And so it's, it's there by Krishna's nature. Krishna's Varnashram is cause of modern day caste system. What do you say? Is Krishna's Varnashram the cause of the caste system today? Varnashram. Huh? Reply? No, what? I can't hear what you say, Maharaji. Um. No, Maharaj, because nowadays uh, even the Brahmanas are not acting like a Brahmana. They are not following their, their, their caste. And we are also dressed in this age of Kali. Yeah, they talk about Jati Brahmans, right? But Jati, Jati Brahman is meaningless. We want to see Karma Brahmans, Brahmans who work like Brahmans. Do the work of the Brahman. What is the work of the Brahman? Patan Patan Yajan Yajan. Yes, very good. Yes. It means there are duties for the Brahman. They have to know what their duty is. They should work like Brahmins. And they shouldn't just say, I'm Brahman and sit in the office as a Sudra. Or open the shop and be a Vaishya. When Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati was giving Brahman initiation to people who were not born in Brahmana families, then he brought everybody to Vrindavan. All the Brahman, all the shopkeepers, they closed their shops. They didn't want to do business with them because all the people with the shops in Vrindavan, they were all Brahmins. And they were all Brahmins. They didn't want to, get, they didn't want to do business to people who were not born Brahmins. They thought these people are not real Brahmins. They shouldn't have the Brahman thread. 
And they were, they were sitting in the shop doing business and they didn't want to... <laughs> Anyway, how do we apply Varnashram in ISKCON? Anyone? Do we have Brahmins in ISKCON? No, Maharaj. Really? <laughs> we only have one. We only have one one uh, caste. That is Das. We are we follow Das system. We are all servants of. Krishna or servants of servants of Krishna. Yes, that's true. What about Daivi Varnashram? Maharaj, we can create Varnashram within Eskon by, you know, by creating awareness in our community that, you know, and Grihastha should focus on all these three aspects. You know, we are focusing on Vadija, but we are forgetting Go and Krishi. So if, you know, if the community focus on all these three aspects, Go, Krishi and Vadija, then we can, you know, take a step towards Varnashram. Because Varnashram can only be done once we live our life revolving around Go means cow and Krishi, agriculture. And what was the other thing you said? Go, Krishi and? Vanija. Vanija means business. Oh. Whatever work we are doing, okay. whatever business we are doing. Okay, thank you. So we are heading towards our businesses uh, and we are, you know, doing good in that. But we are neglecting these two aspects of Go and Krishi. Uh -huh. So ultimately in the end we are suffering. Uh -huh. Very good, yes. Yes, we certainly, within Iskan we do have Varnashram, we have like Brahmins, we have Kshatriya. Oh, well, we, we have brahmachari, sannyasis, grihastas and vanaprastas, we have these things. We don't have too many vanaprastas, but there are gradually coming more and more vanaprastas. People are recognizing that need. And uh, we have a few sannyasis, we have a lot of grihastas, we have some brahmacharis. We have also even brahmacharinis. So this is Varnashram, the, the, the spiritual orders. Prabhupada, uh, devotees as Prabhupada, should we label people? Should people be identified as Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Sudra? Prabhupada said, no. He said, you're all devotees. We're all devotees. But still, principle is there. The different duties are there. Taking care of the cows, some people do business, some people worship the deity, some people are teaching, studying shastras and giving classes and writing books and things. Some are managing. The different divisions are there within this con. So this is Daivi Varnashram, doing whatever is necessary for the service of Krishna. So Krishna, Krishna's Varnashram is not properly followed today. People have not followed it properly. The cause of destroying the desire for enjoyment cause of destroying the desire for enjoyment. Human society is similar to any other animal society. But to elevate men from the animal status, the above-mentioned divisions are created by the Lord for the systematic development of Krishna consciousness. From the purport of text 13. Yeah, we have to be properly organized. The divisions are there to help people develop Krishna consciousness, to elevate people from the animal status. Without Varnashram, there is simply animal life. Uh, Prabhupada explains, he said, just like in universities, they have subjects which are not taught very, not many students, just like they teach things like Latin, you know, ancient languages, or even nowadays, you know, you don't have so many students studying, but still they keep, they keep the department, they keep the course there. He said in the same way, he said, we want to have Varnashram and we want to show people that Varnashram is a perfect system for organizing society. It's a perfect system because it's caring. The brahmanas are meant to care. Everyone's meant to care for each other and concern for each other. 
and helping look after the welfare of each other, not for exploitation and thinking, I'm high class, you're low class. That is very wrong. Okay, text number 15. All the liberated souls in ancient times acted with this understanding of my transcendental nature. Therefore, you should perform your duty following in their footsteps. All the liberated souls, right? Who are these liberated souls? Well, you could say the Mahajans. We should follow their, follow their example, follow in their footsteps. Mahajano yenagata sapanta. So they acted with this understanding of my transcendental nature. They understood Krishna's transcendental nature. Srila Prabhupada explains, to retire from the activities of Krishna consciousness and to sit aloof, making a show of Krishna consciousness is less important than actually engaging in the field of activities for the sake of Krishna. Question, what is the significance of the above statement? Someone, how do you understand this statement? Everything for the sake of Krishna. Yes. What's more important? Engaging in devotional service? Yes. Want to see practical activities, the field of activities, not just simply making a show, sitting, doing nothing. You know, just sit and, oh, I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm just thinking of Krishna, I'm always thinking of Krishna. That's, you know, we want to see people actually working for Krishna, engaging in the activities for the sake of Krishna. So we don't want just a bunch of idle people. Okay? Objectives. We explained the connection between chapter 3 and 4, right? We want to understand transcendental knowledge. Knowledge had been covered. We want to, we're going, hearing about it in chapter 4. Then discuss the qualification to understand Bhagavad Gita. You all know that, devotee and friend. Discuss the mystery of Lord's appearance. Yes, you came up with several points, Krishna's appearance, how it's mysterious. The results of the Lord's descent. The results of the Lord's descent. What were some of the results? Paritranaya sadunam, vinas chaya chaduskritam, dharma samstapanartaya, these things. The transcendental nature of Krishna's appearance with reference to Sanskrit and analogies. That's, that's what we did, the mystery of Lord's appearance. The meaning of the word tattvataha, right? The meaning of the word. The, Tattvata, we explained what was the meaning of the word Tattvata, anybody remember? In truth. In truth, very good Mataji, thank you. And then discuss the Lord's reciprocation with different categories of devotees, the Jnani, the Yogi, the Karmi and the devotee. And then the basis of the Varnashram system. The basis of the Varnashram system is everyone should work according to their guna and karma. Analyze the similarities and differences between the Varnashram system and the modern caste system. A lot of difference, right? Modern caste system, bogus, is all based on birth. People keep, take advantage of the birthright to exploit others. Arguments to defeat false allegations that Krishna's Varnashram is cause of modern day caste system. Bhagavad Gita, Chatur Varnam Maya system, Guna Karma. We present the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna said, 
present the need for Varnashram in the present humanity. The need for Varnashram, organized society. People should know how to connect to each other, how to help each other, how to care for each other. Very important. End quote. There are two classes of men. Some of them are full of polluted material things, while their hearts, within their hearts, and some of them are materially free. Krishna consciousness is equally beneficial for both of these persons. <laughs> right? Some are full of polluted things and some of them are free, materially free. So Krishna consciousness is good for everyone. Any question? Anybody has any questions today? Yes, Hare Krishna. So, like, uh, in which Varnashram uh, uh, I am, like, uh, my nature is of Kshatriya, Brahmana, how to recognize them? Just a minute. <laughs> We got a storm blowing here in Mayapur. You're asking me in this Vanashram? Yes, what? Maharaji, how to recognize that whether my nature is of a Kshatriya, Brahmana, Vaishya, or Shudra? You have to be guided. Spiritual teacher should be there to direct you according to your nature. Everyone supposed to be guided by a spiritual teacher who's, who knows you, who, stu who, who stu knows your nature. And your parents are also there. They understand your nature as well. They should understand what is... And you yourself should know what is... Of course, we're, we're very easily influenced. We may think, oh, I won't make much money in that. I don't want to be that. I want to be in the, the top position. We have to understand, however, what is our nature and what will satisfy us. When we work against our nature, we will, we will not feel comfortable, we will not feel happy. We try to do something which we're not meant to do, we won't be comfortable, we won't like it. So you have to understand, just like you try to be a brahmana, you don't like to read, you don't like to, you want to be a brahmana? You, you ask somebody to worship the deity, we had one boy, tried some, one time he was supposed to worship the deity. He would do arti in two minutes. It was supposed to take 30 minutes. He would do the whole thing in two minutes. <laughs> you know, he just, couldn't, he just couldn't imagine standing there for half an hour offering all the articles. He just wasn't the Brahmin. And so it's like that. We have to understand, we have to... You know, trial and error can also reveal to us what is our actual nature. We will feel properly situated when we're properly engaged according to our nature. You understand? Yes, I think trial and error would be the answer for me. Yes, sometimes that's what we have to do, trial and error, you know. You try to do something. You know, somebody tries to be the temple president, they just, they just can't do it, you know, it's just so much stress and worry, they don't want to be, it's not their nature. They like to preach, they like to study and worship the deity, they don't want to be running a temple. But sometimes you have to do it, because nobody else. Anyway, you know, gradually when somebody else comes along who's qualified, you get them to do it, and you give it up, and you take up doing what you want to do according to your nature. Is that okay? Okay, any other questions? All right, so I'll see you next week. We'll go ahead, we'll finish the fourth chapter next Saturday. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.
Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you. Have a nice Janmashtami and Prabhupada Vyasa Puja. Yes, have a good festival, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Hare Krishna. Big storm.